In the early morning hours of May 14th in 2008, Brandon Swanson would make a phone call to his parents informing them that he had driven his car into a ditch and was unable to get his car back out. He told his parents his approximate location, which he thought was roughly 10 minutes away from their house. Brandon's parents, Brian and Annette, jumped in their car and headed in his direction, but they were unable to locate him. While being on the phone with each other, Brandon decided it would be the best to walk towards the lights he could see in the distance. Brandon and his father Brian would stay on the phone during this time, but around 2.30 a.m., Brandon would say, oh shit, and those would be the last words his father would ever hear from him. This is the bizarre disappearance of Brandon Swanson. Brandon, who was 19 at the time of his disappearance, was attending Minnesota West Community and Technical College. The school year had just ended, so Brandon and his friends were celebrating in nearby Canby, Minnesota. Before this, he started at a party in the small town of Lynn, which was seven miles southwest of his home in Marshall. According to reports from those who attended the party, they stated that Brandon did not look intoxicated and was hardly drinking probably due to the fact that he had to make the 30-minute drive back home that night. A little past midnight and into the morning hours of May 14th, Brandon said his goodbyes to his friends and headed back home. This was a drive that Brandon knew very well. He lived at home with his parents since it wasn't too far from the Minnesota West Campus. Canby was 35 miles west of his home in Marshall, and the entire drive between Canby and Marshall is completely done on State Highway 68. There is little to no traffic on this highway, especially during the morning hours. During his drive home, he had managed to get his Chevy Lumina stuck in the ditch on the side of the road. He attempted to get his car out of the ditch for quite some time over the next hour. After trying to contact his friends multiple times, but none of them answered his repeated phone calls. At 1.54 a.m., he called his parents, Brian and Annette, to let them know about his situation and if they could help him get his car out of the ditch. Brandon told them exactly where he was, which should have only been 10 minute drive from their home. They both jumped into the truck to go help their son and get him home safe. When they arrived at the location, Brandon said he was at, they were unable to locate him or the vehicle. They contacted Brandon to make sure he told him the, the correct location and Brandon getting frustrated with his parents being unable to follow his directions ensured them that he was where he said he was. His parents began to honk their horn and flash their headlights, but Brandon was unable to see or hear either of these. Brandon decided to try flashing his headlights, but they were unable to see his either. Growing frustrated and impatient, Brandon decided to do something else. He told his parents that he could see lights in the distance that should be from the town of Lind. They decided they would meet at a local bar parking lot in town. Brian dropped off his wife and headed towards Lind. I do want to add that there are conflicting reports on whether Annette was with Brian during this time. Some reports say Brian dropped her off, but in later interviews, Annette stated that she was never dropped off back at home. This is not the only part of the story that has conflicting information. Brian and possibly Annette as well remained on the phone with Brandon during his whole walk towards what he thought was a town of Lynn, and Brandon described exactly where he was walking. He told his father that he was walking along a gravel road and was taking a shortcut through a field. He also said he had walked past a few fences and he could hear the sound of running water nearby. Even though he was unable to see much in the dark, he just continued to head in the direction of the lights in the distance. One thing I do want to note here is that Brandon was legally blind in one of his eyes, so seeing anything at this time of night would be very difficult for him. Brian has stated that he was on the phone with him for over 45 minutes, and around 2.30 a.m., Brandon said, oh shit, and those would be the final words that anyone would hear from Brandon. Now here is some more conflicting information from what I have researched. A lot of reports state that after Brandon said his final words on that phone call, it would immediately disconnect. In an interview, Annette stated that this was not the case, and they repeatedly tried to get Brandon to answer them on the phone. Then they hung up the call thinking Brandon might have dropped his phone and was trying to help him find it by having the phone ring and the phone light up in the dark to make it easy for him. What we do know as fact is that the last 45 minute call with Brandon was the last time anyone spoke with him. 
Brandon's parents got in contact with his friends and they all went searching for Brandon but were unable to locate him. At 6 a.m., Annette contacted the local authorities to report Brandon missing. The problem in the beginning was that Brandon was already an adult, so authorities didn't have any urgency to try to locate Brandon. After a few hours of Brian and Annette explaining exactly what happened, they finally decided to classify Brandon as a missing person and the search would begin. They began the search where Brandon said he was in the beginning, but were unable to locate any evidence of him or his vehicle. Authorities were able to trace the call to a cell tower that Brandon's phone connected to, and it was near the city of Tonton, which was 20 miles away from where he told his parents where he was. Now, according to the timeline, this doesn't make much sense because it should have taken Brandon only 15 minutes to get to his location, but from the time he left the party to the time he contacted his parents was around two hours. The only real explanation would be that he struggled to get his car out of the ditch for far longer than we expected. Sadly, even with a better understanding of the timeline, there are really no clues or any evidence to give us a better idea of what really happened to Brandon. Authorities have conducted multiple searches in the area trying to locate Brandon or even any information that could lead to an explanation of what really happened. All we really have are a few theories of possible outcomes that I would like to go over. Now our first theory is one that is very unlikely, but some people do think that Brandon could have wanted to start over a new life and just disappear. Now this doesn't make much sense and there is no evidence of him wanting to do this. Remember he did make multiple attempts to in contact with his friends to help him get his car out of the ditch and even got his parents to try to help him as well. I think if he really wanted to disappear, he wouldn't have stayed on the phone with his father during that last 45 minute phone call and would have just continued on with his plan of disappearing. He would have just crashed his car in the ditch and disappear without making contact with anybody. He didn't take any extra clothes to change into and his bank accounts were not depleted before the night or have not been accessed after this night either. To me, this is just an unlikely theory. Now there is always a theory of foul play, but remember this is a very secluded area. The population is very low, and more than likely no one was waiting around in these desolate farmlands hoping some innocent bystander would come walking through these fields. There is also the theory that he wanted to take his own life, which is also very unlikely. Brandon was doing very well in school and had a lot of friends as well. Unless there was some hidden personal issues going on that nobody knew about, also, if this was the case, more than likely we would have some information and his body would have turned up at some point. Now this leaves us with the most possible theory that it was just a fateful accident that took Brandon's life that night. One thing to bring back up is Brandon being legally blind in one eye and when he left his car in the ditch that night, he also forgot to bring his glasses. This along with it being pitch black out where he was walking was not a good combination. Even after the incident on the phone with his father, his cell phone has never been recovered, so even if he fell down in the nearby river or dropped his phone, Brandon was able to pick it back up and keep it with him. For whatever reason, he did not answer the repeated phone calls from his parents. Now really depending on the type of phone he had at the time, a cracked screen could have prevented him from answering the phone calls. The iPhone at this time did have just a touchscreen, but phones like the Nokia N95 or the LG Chocolate had touchscreens but also had buttons to answer and hang up phone calls as well. I was unable to find any information regarding exactly what phone Brandon had during this time. Many believe that Brandon might have fallen into the river but got out and continued toward his destination of Lind. Due to being unable to see in the dark and getting lost, Brandon eventually fell victim to hypothermia. He could have possibly wandered into the mudlands near the area, which have up to 8 foot tall vegetation and just never made it back out. Cadaver dogs on multiple times did alert for human remains in this area over the many, many searches that have been done. Again, due to the high vegetation and muddy nature of this area, it has always been difficult to find any remains or clues related to Brandon. So even with the possibility of this being a location, nothing has ever come from this. Another possibility could be Brandon made it out of the water and just succumbed to hypothermia in any of the nearby fields in the area. 
props in the area would have easily concealed his body, and harvesting machines could have unknowingly disposed of his body. From my understanding, farmers in the area made it difficult for searchers to thoroughly check the farmlands. All those people searching and ruining their crops, which would be their only source of income, was not a risk the farmers were willing to take. It was also stated that cadaver dogs did alert to remains on a harvesting machine, but I was unable to find any confirmed reports about this. There are over 120 square miles of search area that has been investigated by authorities on multiple occasions. After all these years and multiple searches, we are still not any closer to knowing what happened to Brandon Swanson on that fateful night back in 2008.